Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We thank God for today. Uh, today is 7th April 2024. I'm talking on the character foundation needed for ministry. The character foundation needed for ministry. So we are on a journey, in case you are joining us for the first time, we are on a journey. Uh, we started looking at the ministry systems of the believer last year, um, August. And uh, we've come to a place where we are examining or looking at the foundations that are necessary for ministry. And uh, we've already established the point that ministry is not something we do, it is something we become. And ministry is a fruit-bearing part of a believer. When you start bearing fruit, you are in ministry. And it's important that we understand that. Um, I want to do a recap from 28th October, 2023, when I preached on crucial ministry foundations at Bethel. We were talking about the, 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 the three major foundations that need to be laid in a believer to prepare him or her for ministry, uh, we saw there were three broad foundations. And these three, each of them had has four strands. Okay, so the three are the foundation of knowledge, number two, the foundation of character, and number three, the foundation of leadership. So the foundation of knowledge has four strands the knowledge of the word of God, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of yourself, and the knowledge of the cosmos. And so far, uh, that is what we have touched on. That's the only, that's the only um, aspect of the foundation that we have touched on. We brought to an end the last one, the series on the last one, the knowledge of the cosmos, last two weeks. And today, we are moving on to the foundation of character. And under that foundation, I gave four strands. I said, mountains are brought low, valleys are exalted, crooked places are made straight, rough places are made smooth. And I chose that from Isaiah 40, verse 3 to 5. And so I said that that's what the foundation of character. I believe that these four things, they encompass everything that has got to do with character development or character formation of the believer. And I'm going to talk about that today. 
that the foundation of leadership also has four strands, submission to authority, service, sacrifice, and warfare. But so now we are on the foundation of character, the foundation of character. Um, we all see from scripture that God is very mindful of foundations. As a matter of fact, uh, God spends more time, more resources in laying foundations. Uh, a ministry that was to last for three and a half years had a foundation of 30 years, the ministry of Jesus. And that's how, that's the picture he wanted to show us, that um, three years is equal to 30 years foundation. So for every one year of manifestation, you need 10 years of foundation. This is, this is, impor this is important, it's very true. Actually, when you keep doing something consistently, for a period of 10 years, that is when you can see a word or two about what you are doing. Why am I saying that? Because in the Bible, you see the number 10 is a number for testing, trials, uh, and all that. I've thought about that, so I, I don't want to believe at that point. But if you have not spent 10 years in marriage, you are, you are not really qualified to say a word or two. In ministry, in business, you cannot, you cannot, give, you cannot give a certain kind of counsel. At least 10 years is enough. Looking, looking at Jesus' model, 10 years to one year. Uh, so if you want to go higher, you must go down. Anything that springs up immediately has no root. Matthew 13, verse 5. It said, the one that fell on the rocky soil sprang up immediately because there was no depth. There was no depth of earth. And so God's, God's plan is in... Um, when you look at Hosea chapter 14, verse 5, you will see God's, God's plan uh, for us. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. So grow, the lily is a plant. It's, it's, not a, it's not a tree. It's a small, small plant. But it says your outward appearance may be like the lily, but underneath you should be like the cedar of Lebanon. And the cedar of Lebanon was a tree that had giant, mighty roots. And the roots extended very far, as far as the branches. You know, so it was a very solid tree. And God compares his people. He said, that's how I want you to be. So in Isaiah 37, verse 31, the Bible also puts it very succinctly. It says that um, the remnants and the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Before anything of God will come up on the surface, then you, you know that a lot of things have gone inside. Before anything, you see, if you will see an inch of the manifestation of what God is doing, it means that a lot of resources have gone inside. For you to see that one inch sprout or spring up, a lot of things have gone inside. If it is God doing it, so you may see it as one inch of, or, or the height of one, one, let's say one meter, and you may take it for granted till you, are, you attempt to uproot it. Then you will know that the thing is, is very deep. He doesn't want us to be one mile long, one inch thick. Our depth must be deeper than our height. Always. Always. And so um, this issue of character... Um, in, in, in the believer, uh, when you become born again, there's a principle of formation. God forming you into something. Formation is a next stage after creation. God creates and then forms. In fact, when you read Genesis, you see there are things God created and things that he formed. Even in man, man, God created man and then formed man. In Genesis 1, 27, it says, so God created them, man, in his own image. In the image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The word create means that God brought man out of nothing. Man did not exist before. Okay, so he created him. But then, look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. You will see that it is, that, that there's a difference between being created and being formed. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So 
God created man, but it wasn't the created man that was put in a field. It was a formed man. Why? The field was a place of assignment. God was going to give man an assignment to tend the garden and keep it. And God did not just put the man that he had created. He said the Lord God planted the garden and there he put the man whom he had formed. And so you can be created, but God will want to form you before he fills you, filled, before he puts you in a field. If you are looking for God to put you in a field, in a place for assignment, God's formula is that you have been created, you have to be formed. And that is where this issue of character development comes in. Now, there's somebody in the Bible whose life really explains these two words, created and formed. And when you go to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1, you will, you will, see, you will see who I'm talking about. Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now, that says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, and I have called you by your name, you are mine. See, the Bible is not just uh, a book. I mean, nothing in the Bible is for decoration. Here, it's consistent. He said, he created you, O Jacob, but he formed you, O Israel. Which means that the journey between creation and formation is like the journey between Jacob and Israel. And Jacob and Israel were not the same person. They were two different people. Uh, one person in two different states. Let me put it that way. Well, Jacob was transformed to become Israel. I see the number of years it took for Jacob to be transformed to become Israel. So God took him, created him as Jacob, but he formed him as Israel before, before God could entrust to him the, um, the, 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 his destiny assignment. You know, when you apply it to the new creation, it's the same thing. You write that 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. All things are, 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 are passed away. Behold, all things are new. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Behold, all things have become new. So if any man be in Christ, a new creation. That's a creation. So you are created in Christ. But then you have to be formed. The Bible says, Galatians 4.19, My little children, in whom I travel again in birth, so Christ is formed in you. So it's not enough for you to be a new creation. You know, you have to be formed. Christ must be formed in you. That process of being formed is related to your soul. I, I talked about three stages of salvation. Your spirit man is saved, but your soul too must be saved through a process of transformation. The, the major work the Holy Spirit is going to do in your life is the salvation of the soul, not the spirit. The salvation of the spirit is instant. The day you, you said, Lord Jesus, I believe in you, instantly your spirit was recreated. You became a new creation, a born again, a born again person. But that is not the end of the work. That is only the beginning. The major work is the transformation of the soul. Okay. Now, when you read the Bible in James 1.21, you come across this phrase, uh, salvation of the soul. It said, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Now, James was written, was, was written to believers. And yet he said, your soul needs to be saved. And, and one may ask, now, if I'm saved, why does my soul need salvation? He was talking about the transformation, the character formation. How God conforms you to his image, practically. That journey, that work, that is the main work of the Holy Spirit. That's why we come to church, read our Bibles, uh, pray and fast, um, uh, uh, try to hear the voice of God. All that we are doing now is not to go to heaven. Going to heaven is not connected to uh, uh, the things we are doing. Going to heaven, you got a place in heaven when you became born again. So heaven is a place you come from now, but all that we are doing is to become better representatives of heaven on earth. How you can be a better citizen of heaven on this earth? That will, that will depend on how your soul structure, how your soul has been, has been transformed. How your soul has been impacted on by the Lord. That is, that is, that is the transformation of the soul. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38 to 39 also talks about that. 
Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. We are those who believe to the saving of the, of the soul. So to draw back is to go into perdition. It's like you have been saved. Okay? You, but if you draw back, it means that you are in, renouncing your faith and you are going back to perdition. But you, we need to press on to the saving of the soul. Because that is the next major thing after the saving of your spirit. Your soul too must be saved. Your soul must be saved. Now, the state of the soul is the main determinant of spiritual maturity. When we say somebody is growing spiritually, it is not your spirit man that is growing. It is the, how your spirit has impacted on your soul. That reflects in your attitudes, in your choices, in your relationships, in your actions, and your deeds. And with the outward, the outward one is what we see as character. But then it starts from within. It starts from the impact that your spirit has made on your soul. Your spirit man has a lot of good things, a lot of God things in it, you know, which was freely given to you. Wisdom is there in your spirit man. Righteousness, holiness is in your spirit man. Everything that is of God is in your spirit man. But how it has impacted on your soul, because your soul is not born again, how your soul, your mind, your emotions, your personality, your will, they have been impacted by your spirit, by the Holy Spirit through in your spirit. That is the index of spiritual maturity. That is what shows that you are growing as a believer. So the salvation of the soul is the second stage of salvation. And the character of a believer is directly linked to the progress he has made in the salvation of the soul. So the state of, when we say your character, we are talking about how your soul has been impacted by your spirit to the extent that the spirit has cut through the flesh to produce fruit. And that fruit is sin. Okay. Now, character is the beginning of ministry because it is the first stage of fruit bearing. When we say somebody is bearing fruit, the very first stage is the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the born again spirit. When we say fruit of the spirit, it's not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the fruit of your born again spirit. Your, born, your, your spirit is born again and it produces fruit through the cooperation with the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit, the Bible gives us uh, a summary of it in Galatians 5.22. This one is not exhaustive. It's just a summary. It's just trying to tell you three things. Your disposition towards God, towards others, towards yourself. And they have been grouped in, uh, they have been um, captured in nine, nine, uh, nine things. You know, uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's just one fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It says, against such, there's no law. In other words, against these things, when it comes to these things, there's no limitation. There's no limit to how you can grow in love, peace, joy, patience, long-suffering, gentleness, and, and all that. There's no limit. There's no law against it. No limit. Now, so, it's an indication of how deeply the spirit has pierced through the flesh to produce change. When you begin to bear the fruit of the Spirit, when we see a person becoming born again, then after some time, the person becomes uh, joyful. There's joy without any outward um, cause. There's joy deep in the person. There's peace in the person. There's love. Your love work, how you forgive easily, how you give, how you forgive, how you, you serve, how you care. All those things, when you see they are growing, they mean that the spirit, your spirit man, has pierced through the flesh to produce change. And that's the beginning of ministry. That is the first stage of fruit bearing. The second stage of fruit bearing is when you begin to do good works. When you begin to do good works, what we call the works of ministry. Those are good works. So fruit refers to the character of a person. Okay, then good works is a second stage of fruit bearing. 
When it says, by their fruit you shall know them, it's not just character. It's also by the things they produce, the, things, the products of their ministry, the things they, they attempt to do practically for God, whether they are doing it through him and to him, or they are doing it by another kind of motivation. You know, so we have two things. The fruit, the first stage of fruit bearing is character, the fruit of the spirit. Second stage is the fruit of works, you know, good works. Good works. So your good, the good works are the things you do practically to serve God. Like discovering your destiny ordination, uh, deploying your gifts and, serv- and services to the, the church and, uh, and therefore to God. Those are works. Those are good works. That is not all there is to ministry. The first stage is your character before your works. Now, good works were ordained before you were born that you should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should work in them. Work, work, work in them. So character refers to a person's moral nature, but works refer to the expression that he gives to the purpose and counsel of God through practical kingdom work. So the first stage of your fruit bearing should be your character. When you come to the Lord, what the, the first thing that should be of concern to you and to your pastor should be the fruit of the Spirit before the gift of the Spirit. Because the fruit of the Spirit must come first. Because that is fruit. Fruit, are, fruit must be born. Then the gifts of the Spirit, how you discover them, how you use them, is also the second stage of ministry, fruit bearing. Now, many people come to the Lord, and because the gifts, you know, the gifts, the good words, they were ordained before you were born. So, and the, because the gifts have already been given, they go straight to discovery of giftings, deployment of giftings, developing your giftings at the expense of bearing the fruit. And that's why we have many issues in the church. Because the issues we have in the church now, they are character issues. Lack of consistency, lack of stability, lack of integrity. You know, that's, that's the issue we have in the church right now. Meanwhile, when, when you check how God builds his building, from the template we see in Solomon's building, every stone was worked on in the quarry. You know, it was cut to size, shaped, everything in the quarry. Then when they came to the temple, there was a slot for that stone, and that stone was fitted into that slot. So there was no noise in the temple of Solomon. You, you didn't hear, you will not hear the sound of a hammer, of a chisel, of a saw, whatever. All that work was done in the quarry. When you hear a lot of noise in the church, it means that people have dodged God's school. When you hear a lot of noise in the church, you know, you see a lot of um, scandals, a lot of all these things. It means that people did not allow God to take them through your school. Because if God takes you through your school, the first stage will be fruit of the Spirit. He will deal with all that before he introduces you to your destiny ordination. That this is what you have been called to do. And so you, you do that upon a foundation of character. It's very important. Now, when we come to the Lord, for instance, the Bible talks about first love. It's not only first love. There are also first works. But you see, the love talks about our disposition towards God, relationship towards God. Then the works also talks about what we do. Okay? So these two things, you can see them in Revelation 4, verse 5. Chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Um, it says, um, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. This one is about relationship. The first love is what is going to produce the fruit. But remember, from where you are falling, repent and do the first works. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. When they lost their first love, they also lost their first works. Because the first works, that is good works. But the first love, that is relationship. That is what builds character. Character. So the character foundation that we need for ministry is very crucial, very, very important. If there is anything that we will have to spend our time, any prayer we have to pray, is the prayer for what has taken place in our spirit to seep into our soul, for our soul to be transformed. 
When you see that you cannot control your temper, that should be of concern to you. That should be a prayer point. That should be a, 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 a thing to study about and to ask God for mercy to help you. When you see that you can't control your lust, that should be a prayer point. That should be of concern to you. But you see, these days, these days in, in the church, these days in the church, uh, those things are not what is important to the new believer, the every believer. When somebody becomes born again, the next thing the person is trying to find out is what is in it for me? How God will bless me? How God will attend to my needs? But what should be of paramount importance, utmost importance, is how I am bearing the fruit of the Spirit. When that one is in place, you will have a solid foundation for every work that God will call you to, to do. So why is character important to God? And what even is character? Because we are saying character. Character. Uh, if somebody is just thinking about maybe behaving nicely, being courteous. You can be courteous. You can be, um, you can be behaving nicely to people and all that. But that's what I'm talking about. You see, character is a consistency of good fruit. That is not coming out of um, something trivial, but it's coming f from a deep work that has been etched upon the surface of your heart. A deep work that has been engraved upon your heart. So character talks about consistency. It's about being consistently consistent in producing good fruit. That's character. What, when, when, let's say, today you put on a, a form of godliness, and tomorrow we can't trust you that you will do the same. You don't have character. Because today you can, you can say, I'm in a good mood. So if somebody insults me, I will not mind the person. But tomorrow you will just go off and just insult the person. That's not character. We are talking about the consistency. And the, the way we can, we can be consistent is for the thing to be permanent in your heart. So that the, the, the product... Is, is just automatic. You know, how you take a surface and ingrain a design on the surface. Let's say you want to do a design, maybe tie and dye. You take a surface and then you ingrain the design on the surface so that from that time, you just can multiply the design just like that. Why? Because it has been ingrained on the surface. That, that engraving of the design on the surface that is character. And it produces good fruit consistently. So it is who you are, not what you are trying to do. Who you are. Invariably, what you do will spring out of who you are. So the who you are is what God is at working on. For instance, you can, you can speak good things. Okay? And then tomorrow you can speak bad things. But the Bible says that a river cannot give both salt and fresh water. And then, so when God circumcises your heart, then you can consistently speak good things. It means God has done a work on you. You have attained character. Character. I will explain more. So God forms us into the right shape of vessels before he pours out his grace through us. God is interested, he is concerned about how we have been formed before he pours out. Because how you have been formed will determine how the grace is dispensed. God can give you grace to heal, but if you have no character, you will merchandise the grace. If you have no character, you will use the grace in pride. If you have no character, you will take advantage of people because of the grace. That's why God is mindful of how he forms you and shapes you how he, 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 he forms the image of God in you, and that will determine how the grace is administered. So there can be many gifted people, but you can't trust them. You can be very gifted, gifted in leadership, but we can't trust you. You can be very anointed, but we can't trust you with a lady to disciple her. Oh, yes. So uh, yeah, that, that, that's because of character issues. You can be very gifted and anointed, but we can't trust you with money. When, it, when money is given to you, 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 not, you are not consistent. You see how character is important, even in the work of God. So, the formation of the vessel 
is a major work of the spirit. And it involves crushing, molding, remolding. It's the work of a porter. So what the work that God does on us is the work a porter does with a clay. In Jeremiah 18, uh, verse 1 to 6, God told Jeremiah, he said, go down to the porter's house and I'll show you something. Go to verse 2. Arise, go down to the porter's house. And there I'll cause you to hear my words. You have to go down. Because that, that, that process will always starts from down. God will have to come down you know, and work on you. Okay. Then he said, uh, go on, move on. Then I went down to the porter's house. And there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the porter. So he made it again into another vessel. As he seemed good to the porter to make then the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this porter? Says the Lord, look, as the clay is in the porter's hand, so are you in my hand, O Israel. And so, when we talk about character formation, let's look at the clay and the porter. You see, God wants us to come to a place where we can be like clay in his hand, where he can form us as he likes. Because every vessel has been formed to meet a need. The kettle, the pot, the teacup, the mug, the glass, all of them are vessels. The, the, the water container, what we call cooler, you know, the well, I mean, all of them are vessels, but they have different sizes and shapes, and they all do different things. And so God wants us to become pliable tools in his hand, so that he can shape us into the kind of vessel that we'll be comfortable dealing with to dispense his grace through. Yes. And that's why God um, uh, upholds character. And is a, uh, a, when character, when you, you are growing to become like God, growing to become like God in his image, okay? Yeah, that is character. Go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. And let me explain a certain word. One, two, three. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in this last day spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself paid our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, Okay, now, it, 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 that's, that's okay. Now, you see a, a, a phrase, uh, express image, that Jesus is the express image of God. That word, express image, is one word in the Greek, and that word is character. But the spelling is C-H-A-R-A-K-T-E-R. And that's where we got the word character, English word character from. This one is also character. And let me explain, let me give you the meaning of that word character. The meaning of that word character means an engraving. An engraving, as I explained. An engraving is the art of forming designs by cutting, corrosion by acids, a photographic process, etc., on the surface of a metal plate, a block of wood, or the like. For or as for the purpose of taking off impressions or prints of. I explained that a while ago. I just want to quote it from uh, Google. The meaning of the word engrave and engraving. Okay, so it means to emboss something through cutting. When you, sometimes you want to make a design, you, have, you want to get uh, the template that you can reproduce. It can, be, it can involve cutting on the hard surface just to create the design, to inscribe the design on the hard surface so that when you dip it in the ink or, or paint or whatever, and you emboss it, you have the design right on the surface that you want. Are you getting me? That is, that is how it is done. Okay? So, it's like tie and dye. How they do, you know, how they, you have to be, they have the design first, then you dip it into the, the uh, is it dye? Then you put it on the material, you know, and then you get your design. So, after you have gotten that template, every other thing is just produced, you know, it's just mass production. Why? Because you have gotten the template. You, it cannot go wrong. 
That is what God wants to achieve in us. He wants to attain character where his image is afflicted upon our souls to the extent that, to the extent that our souls begin to take the shape of his nature such that he can entrust us with his goodies because he knows that it's in safe hands. Hello? Yes. So the process of engraving describes how God shapes us into his image. The child of a lion must look like a lion. Express image means exact copy, photocopy. The point is, God wants his children to look like him, period. God wants his children to look like him, practically. Not just in spirit, but also in our practical day-to-day work. He wants us to reflect his nature. That's, that's, why, that's, that's why there's all this big deal about character. Because all the critical areas that God works on us is to make sure that we are adaptable and compatible with him. Yes, yes. So God wants us to be meek, not because it will help us in our relationship with people, but that state of meekness will afford God the, the opportunity to use us. So that when you, when you are meek, you are not just meek for people's sake. God has, God has helped you to be meek. The same way you are meek with people, in the same way you are also meek before God. So that God can just turn you like that, you will go. Can turn you like that, you will go. If God doesn't do that deep work in us, God cannot use us. We cannot bring, bring him enough profit. We cannot bring him the pleasure he desires from us. That's the reason why God works on us, so that we will become pliable tools in his hand. God doesn't want us to be uh, morally sound just, just because he is holy, you know, and all that, but because moral integrity will produce the kind of immunity that we must have for God to trust us with his precious things. Come to Mark 7 verses. Matthew 7 verses. You say you cannot cast uh, pearls before swine. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. So you see that God doesn't just give his precious things to, to swine. He has to, he has to, he has to make sure that that, that, that that nature of a swine has been changed. He doesn't give pearls to swine and then give that which is holy to the dogs. That's why God wants you and I to come to a place where he has helped us to be morally sound or live a life of purity. It's not just because, uh, no, yes, yes, because he's holy, but number two, because Purity will give you immunity from corruption. And it will help you to be able to keep that which God has given to your hand. Sometimes God gives things, precious things into our hands and we lose them because of careless living or loose living. And he will not give pearls, cast pearls before swine. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 20. It matters how set apart you are for his use. It's not just a matter of the grace that you have received, but how your vessel has been perished, set apart, is important to God. But in the great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. How sanctified, how set apart your vessel is determines how you'll be useful for the master. Not useful for the church. Because you can be useful to the church and not to the master. You can be a people's priest who blesses people, but God doesn't know you. In Ezekiel 44, he, he put a distinction between people's priests and his priests. He said, the priest who led them astray to worship idols. I will not remove them from the sanctuary. They will be my gatekeepers in the sanctuary and they will stand before them to minister to them. But the sons of Zadok, who did not go astray, I will let them come and minister to me the holy things. They will put their fat and their blood in their hands and they will approach me to minister to me my holy things. 
So people's priests can bless people, can lead people, can, but God's priests stand before God. And God wants us to be his priest, not people's priest. Because he wants us to dispense his grace from his presence to people. Not just to run away to dispense grace. So it matters how set apart your vessel is. God wants us to live in peace with other people, not only because it will save us from trouble, as an, another example. What I'm trying to say is that all the things that God wants to do in us, it's not just because of us, because of him. It will help him. It will help, help us to be adaptable to him, compatible with him, so that he can freely entrust us with his purposes, his ideas, and give into our custody his goodies. And I'm saying that he, uh, even, even becoming meek, it's not just for you. It's so that God will attain a vessel that is pliable. Becoming morally sound, it's not just for you, so that God can entrust you with something because he knows that you have the immunity that can fight against corruption. And number three, living in peace with people is not just to save you from trouble, but also because God is very mindful of his name and he doesn't want you to soil his name. That's why he will teach you even how to live with people. Otherwise, you, you, you drag his name into disrepute. And God is very mindful of his name. When you come close to God, he becomes protective of certain things. One of them is his name. So in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14, David sinned against God. There was a child that came out of that sin, and uh, that child fell sick. And uh, God said, however, I've forgiven you. However, but be because by this deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also who is born to you shall surely die. David fasted and prayed that God will save the child. The child died. Well, God is mindful of his name. What you will do to soil his name? If you say that I am a child of God, the moment you say that, okay, God becomes mindful of what you do because what you do can bring dishonor to his name. There are some names when they put on you, 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 you are forced to behave. Oh, yes. There are some names when they put on you, you are forced to behave. You can't, you can't, you, you, have, you have no choice. One example is the name that God has put on us. So the Bible will say, walk worthy of the Lord, that we may walk worthy of him, fully pleasing him. You know that's that scripture, Galatians 1, 9 to, 10, 9 to 11. That I may be filled with the of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that I may walk worthy of the Lord. Walk worthy of him. It means that if you claim that you know him, then your character must reflect his character. Otherwise, you are bringing disgrace to him. And what you are saying is not true. And God will defend his name. When it comes to his name, he becomes very, very transactional. It says, uh, he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. When it comes to his name, he will lead you, he will warn you, he will, he will correct you, he will not just allow you. So that sometimes, you know why sometimes, um, you know, God in his mercy, when people have, let's say, have, have become men of God, women of God, and you go by that title, and there's something that is in you that you are hiding, God in his mercy will expose you so that you will not swallow his name. Because, you see, for instance, God can give you a name. He, he gives names. Do you know that? God, God can make your name great. Before you be a blessing, your name should be made great. He told Abraham, he said, I will bless you. I will make your name great. Then you shall be a blessing. You can't be a blessing if God has not exalted your name. So the degree to God has exalted your name, the degree to that you can be a blessing to people. Okay, now, God, so when God gives you a name, it means that you can also bring disgrace to God. When God puts you on a platform, it means that one little thing you do can bring disgrace to God. And so God is mindful, mindful of his name. That's why he wants us to, um, he w that's why he takes character issues seriously. The second reason is that God loves to boast about his children, how his children are like him. He loves to boast about how his children are like him. He boasted 
to the devil about Job. In Job 1 8, he said, Have you considered my servant Job? Have you seen that there is none like him? Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. In other words, God was telling Satan, You know, you think that man can never serve me living in this crooked world because you couldn't serve me living in glory. But here's a man I can trust to put you to shame. This man has served me. He said, This man is blameless. He's upright. He fears God and eschews evil. God was boasting about Job. There are people that God boasted about in the Bible. People like Daniel. People like Noah. Ezekiel 14, 14. The people sinned against God. And God said, I will never forgive you. Even if these three men, though Noah, Daniel and Job were in it, they would deliver only themselves by the righteousness, says the Lord. It means that God respected the, the righteousness of Noah, Daniel, and Job. He said, now where we have gotten to, I don't intend to forgive you. I will not forgive you. Even if these three men, they were in this city, eh, they will only be saved by their righteousness. God acknowledged that they were righteous before him. And that is what is important. So don't deceive yourself by saying, oh, uh, uh, all that we do, they are filthy rats. They are not filthy rats. It is all that you do to try to attain salvation that is filthy rags. After you have been saved, all that you do as a result of the work of the Holy Spirit in you is not filthy rags. It's not filthy rags. It's good works. It's fruit. And that is commendable. God boasted about them and said their righteousness would have delivered them. And so God acknowledged their integrity. It wasn't just a one-off thing. They were consistent in character. Character talks about consistency of good fruit. That's why it's a work that is done by the Spirit because no human being can be consistent in good fruit. But when the Spirit has done a deep work in you and he has ingrained or engraved his nature upon your heart, it will reflect. That's why it can take years for God to finish forming his image in a person. Depending on how steep you are in the flesh. It can, that's why God can... You see, this character thing, I've told you that God can mess up your career just to fix your character. I'm, I'm teaching you now why it's so important to God. Most of the things we go through, they are God's mercy to fix our character. Most of the things we lose in life, disappointments and the things we lose, some of them, they are God's mercy to fix our character. Because, because you see, for instance, if, if I talk about pride, which maybe I'll talk about later on, talk about pride, you will see how God are, has arranged that pride should always activate something to bring equilibrium. Anytime pride is in you, something from hell will be dispatched to make sure you attain equilibrium. So that's why I say pride always goes before a fall. And it's all for our good. God, God doesn't, he loves us. God wants us to walk with him till his nature is afflicted upon our souls. Because there are instructions in the Bible that say, be like God. 1 Peter 1, 15, 16. It says, be holy like your father is holy. Okay? But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. He said, you cannot say God is your father and you don't resemble him. Because it's written, be holy for I am holy. If I gave birth to you, there must be some resemblance. At least, you must resemble me. You tell people that I am your father and there is nothing that shows my nature is not in you. You, you don't have my features. You are lying. He said, be perfect as your father is perfect. Matthew 5, 40, 40, 48. Matthew 5, 48. Therefore, it shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. He is telling us to be perfect. That word perfect is the word teleos, which means mature, a full-grown person. And uh, it, it, it means consistent. It suggests having been formed fully as a prototype to ensure uniformity in mass production. Perfect, finished. Be mature. Be perfect. Be finished, complete. Be consistent. Now, if you are finished making the design and engraving the design on the hard surface, 
it means that now the thing is complete, okay? So now everything that you emboss, it's consistent. The same product, the same product. You have, you have, let's say you have formed a mold, a mold, then you have poured concrete in it. The shape of the mold will determine the shape of the concrete. When you remove it, you see everything the same. That's the word telios, mature. It's the same way for father, matured man, telios, full grown man, consistent, finished. That a man of God may be equipped, thoroughly finished, thoroughly finished unto every good work. He may be fully equipped for every good work. That is the, 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 the mind of God. So that you can be as your heavenly father. God is consistent and he wants us also to be consistent in the production of good fruit. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 and verse 8. Be imitators of God. Be imitators of God. Okay, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Now, go to verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So, if you say that you are a child of God, we should see a resemblance between you and God. He said, Im imitators of God. It simply means be, be, uh, behave like products of God. So John, in first John, will say, little children, do not follow, do not imitate uh, 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 the one who is sinning. Why? It is strange. It is strange. Don't imitate the wrong one. Because that will be strange to your character, your nature. The one who gave birth to you, that he, he, he walks uprightly. He imitated somebody who is maybe crawling on the, on, the, on the ground. You know, children can imitate wrongly. Yes, I was observing one child in a queue, you know, with a father. They were going to pray for their staff. Then there was this Chinese man there who, was, who had, uh, is it lordosis, uh, whatever. And then, what, what, what is that one? Kyphos, kyphosis. Kyphosis. Then the child was looking at the Chinese man and the child was attempting to do that. So he was trying. He would do this. Then he would do, you know. Then the father saw him and said, hey, stop that. The child was not being uh, <laughs> rude, but he was simply imitating what he was seeing. But that was a wrong picture. Are you getting me? So John was saying, my little children, do not imitate. Do not follow bad examples because that's not your nature. Your father is God. Imitate him. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God. He who does evil has not seen God. Thank you for the scripture. 3 John 1.11. He said, do not imitate what is evil. Why? Because evil, what is evil, is foreign to your nature. It's foreign to your nature. Okay. So now, I've already established that character is important. But in this series, sub-series, I'm going to talk about four main areas of character formation in God. And I've seen that these four major areas of our lives, God looks at them when it comes to the image being expressed, being embossed in us. And um, um, the four main areas is that mountains and hills, there are mountains and hills that must come down. And there are valleys that must be filled. And there are crooked places that must be made straight. And there are rough places that must be made smooth. Okay, so that will take us to Isaiah 40. <coughs> now, this scripture was talking about John the Baptist, his ministry. And uh, <coughs> let's read it. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So he's going to create a highway for God. I'll show you what that highway is. Then he goes on to say, Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked place shall be made straight, and the rough place shall be made smooth. So these are the four coordinates of character. Your mountains will be brought low. Your low-lying areas will be filled. Your crooked paths will be made straight. Your rough edges will be made smooth so that you have a straight path. 
when we say integrity, we are talking about you being straight. Integrity is that you are the same in private and the same in public. Integrity. You are the same in private and you are the same in public. When your private life does not synchronize with your public life, you don't have character yet. Let me explain. You see, for instance, if let's say, you know, every minister, for instance, we have the altar and the porch. I'm just using that as an example. In the Bible, you will see, let the ministers weep between the porch and the altar. The altar is your public ministry. The porch is your private chamber. What you do in private, what you do off the altar. When you are not preaching, when you are not under the anointing, when you are not ministering your normal life, that's the porch. And so integrity is that just as I'm standing here and you see me nicely dressed, and I will not utter an evil word. I will not uh, do any, anything that is evil in your presence. In my private closet, if I do otherwise, then I don't have character. So you only can know whether you have character or not. You and God. Yes. Because outwardly, when we come to church right now, if I step on your toes, you, you even ask me to forgive you. I get you. That's how spiritual you can get. <laughs> when I step on your toes, say, oh, please forgive me. But how will be your reaction when you leave this place and somebody steps on your toes? So it means that your altar is different from your porch. So you can be a revivalist, okay, like Noah, preaching. You can be a drunkard in the porch. And that is not character. I can be very nice, smiling, and saying nice things to you. And I can be very harsh and mean to my wife in the house. That will not be character. I'm just trying to give you examples that character, when we say character, it means being straight. That's what John came to do. John said the mountains, the high point, should be brought low. And the low-lying area should be it should be raised. Then the crooked place should be made straight. Then the rough place should be made smooth. He said, then all flesh will see the glory of God. That work that John Baptist came to do is the same work we do when we are constructing roads. There are some places that you see that they are low lying. You fail. And there are some places that are standing out. You cut. So sometimes you have to cut to fill the low lying areas. And you show that by the time you finish, you see that the road is straight. Okay? When, when, you are, when you are making a road and then there's a place that is low lying, you see usually river is here, and then river is here, then low lying. You have to raise it and put a culvert so that the water can pass through. Then you raise that place. Another place that is so, that's like a hill, you have to cut it. So that's the work that John the Baptist was going to do. And the result of that work was that he was going to create a pathway. That pathway is called the pathway of righteousness. The pathway of alignment between heaven and earth said that people could experience the glory of God. He said, after the pathway has been created, the glory of God shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. In Matthew 21, verse 32, Jesus Christ confirmed that John actually came to construct that path. For John came to you in the way of righteousness. You don't believe him, but tax collectors and harlots believe him. And when you saw it, you don't you afterward relent and believe him. So this pathway of righteousness, it is created in your heart. So there are things in your heart that are like mountains. When God is shaping your character, God will touch them. They will have to calm down. And there are things in your heart that are low-lying, like defecting the soul, like fears like insecurities, like lack of confidence that God will have to raise or fail. And there are things in your life that are crooked, like immorality, like 
dishonesty, like um, false balance, all that, that God will have to straighten. And then when it comes to the rough places, it's talking about your relationships with others. When all these four, they are done, you see a street, a way of righteousness. That's how you bring glory to God. You say all flesh will see the glory of God in your life. Now, so, as God touches these four areas, an equilibrium is attained. You know equilibrium? Equilibrium is attained because now uh, there have been balances, checks and balances. So the mountain has come down, then the valley too has been exalted. Crooked places have been made straight, then rough edges made smooth. And that state of equilibrium is what character is all about. And God will be working on all these four concurrently. <coughs> Not that he will first deal with the mountains before coming to the valley. No. No. The word of God and the spirit of God, you know, they will combine to do this work concurrently. So God can be working on your pride at the same time working on your lack of confidence. The only God can do that. That's why the word of God can come and it can be a panacea. One word, it can heal this one, heal that one, heal that one, heal that one. Only God can do that. So don't think that unless God finishes working on my pride or my mountain, my mountains and hills, he will not touch my valleys. God will be doing that at the same time. If you allow God and you work with God, he will administer grace, say that grace can help bring all these things to pass. So these are the four areas. The first one is mountains that must be brought low. And uh, this refers to the area of pride and ego. Pride and ego. You will see that pride is something that God really hates because it is one of the stiffest opposition to God. You see, one of the things that will make it difficult for God to release his goodness in your life is pride. Now, you may not be saying, God, I challenge you. But you say, that attitude of pride will not make you stand in alignment with God for God to be able to dispense his grace in you. And so God will deal with it. In fact, God will deal, see, because he loves you, he will crush your pride. He will crush your ego. <laughs> because these areas, they will become problems for God. Lucifer fell because of pride. Okay? And you see, only God can actually deal with pride. And sometimes you may not even know that there is pride in you. So God himself throws his light on you. Then you will know that you are working in pride. And God will do that continually till he attains that texture of your soul that he can work with. Because when we say pride, it's not how you walk like this. <laughs> people sometimes say that when a person walks like that. Some people walk like that. Prayer warriors, for instance. <laughs> when they are coming, they are. Now, that, that's not pride, though. Even though the Bible says a look can be pride. A look. A walk. <laughs> but you don't see, you don't look at how somebody is walking and say he's proud. No. It's in their heart. It can manifest outwardly, but only God can lay a hold on it. Let me tell you a story. You see, there was a point when, I've told you before, um, 2000, before 2005, that I had an encounter, I was very, very critical and judgmental. Very critical, because that's how we were treated. Because the church that we were in, was a strict holiness church. <laughs> Ladies will sit here, men will sit here. When we stand for offering, the men will go first. Ladies will come. No mixture. You, don't, you can't say a lady is your friend. It's a taboo in that church. So that's how we grew up. So it's like um, that mentality. You know, and it's like it was self Pride, if there's a word like that, self-pride, or like priding in yourself. 
I'm proud of my holiness. I'm proud of my humility. You know, you can be proud of your humility. <laughs> Somebody will tell me, say, I'm humble. <laughs> I'm very humble. <laughs> I know Melky wants to ask, what about Moses who said the man Moses was the meekest man on the earth? Melky will ask that question one day. <laughs> but you see, when I had an encounter with God, that encounter with life, when I was standing before the judge, and he was asking me questions I didn't have answers for, and I was shivering to the extent that when I woke up from that dream encounter, I was sweating and shivering. I was afraid because the judge looked like he could sentence me to prison at any moment. That was my fear in the dream. That it was like, how, that's the power that he, he wielded in the dream. That I can just take you to prison at any moment at my will. Asking me for my credentials and I couldn't produce them. And I've been, I had been preaching, for, preaching and teaching for 10 years before that time. I started very early when I was a teenager. So, after that encounter, something left me. It just left me. How to condemn people. It just left me. I can't condemn. You see, I can rebuke. Not that I can rebuke you. I can rebuke you. I can correct you. But I can never condemn you. I can never think that you are I'm better because maybe you fell into sin. I'll restore you. And I'll restore you with, 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 with some kind of um, passion and some kind of fear. But he that did that too, before that time, that will not be the story. There are some encounters God can grant you. There are some certain things that God can allow, allow to happen to you. It will crush you. This is just one example. There are other things God can allow to happen to you that will crush your pride for you to realize that you are nothing. And that's when God will say, now you are ready, and now I, I, I can use you. Because, for instance, if God has sent you to people, to work among people, and you cannot put aside your garment sometimes and put a towel around your waist, you can never wash people's feet. Never wash, never, can never serve people. So God's training for ministry, as far as pride is concerned, is that sometimes he can allow you to be humiliated. Depend on how your flesh is strong. There are some people, their flesh is so strong, God will use a heavy hand to crush them. Say, pa! Then, when you wake up, you will dress up, then you'll be sober. All the things that you were saying, woe to this person, woe to that person, woe to that person. Isaiah had an encounter the next chapter. Isaiah said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people who are unclean, have mercy on me, God. You see, when you, when you come to me, for instance, where, and when you come to, you, you have the chance of seeing me in my prayer room, I always pray for mercy as if I've sinned, as if I've committed a sin. Because I've come to realize that it is God's mercy that sustains me. And I will never for once move without his grace. I can't. And the, result, the reason is because of this experience. It took three weeks for God to take me through that experience and, knew, you know, to sap, to, to squeeze that kind of thing from me. Uh, when I talk about pride, you understand that pride and ego, these two things, they are the cause of a lot of breakdowns in marriages and relationships. It's pride and ego. Women have pride. Men have ego. When, when pride meets ego, <laughs> when merchant meets pearls, and when I'm writing another book, when pride meets ego. That's about a uh, uh, conflict of losing. When pride meets ego. You see? So, God will help us by dealing with that in our lives. Thank you. Dealing with that in our lives. Okay? Now, the second area that we are looking at is valleys to be filled. I'll, when I talk about pride, I can maybe spend like one whole month talking about the pride. So I'm not talking about it now. So I'm just giving you a highlight. Okay. Now, the valleys to be filled. This refers to void, void in our soul. 
that needs to be filled. And this is a very serious area of character formation. The void were created by defects in our souls. And the defects are also created by unmet needs in the soul. <coughs> and I've realized that these defects, they do a lot of damage. Even when it comes to practical ministry, these defects can make you go through detours, delays, plateaus, and it can affect many things. Even what God says do, it can affect it. And so therefore, that's why it is important to submit ourselves to God for God to, he said, that the man of God will be thoroughly furnished. God will not spare. God is so thorough and so detailed in his training that every aspect of your life will be affected before God can say, now go. So this is a character foundation we need before ministry. In other words, before public ministry. Before you can say, look at me. I have something to say. Ah, my generation, listen to me. You must, these things must be dealt with. Otherwise, you can say, look at me, and, and one demon will come and give you a knock. You will not rise again. Yes, I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> you will not rise again because even Jesus, before God said, at first God said, this my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. That's John 3, 17. But God never said, listen to him. Even Jesus, who had been trained for 30 years. God said, no, he's my brother's son. I love him. But don't listen to me yet because he has not been trained, tested. After this, he went to be tested and all that. Then Matthew 17, 5, he came again. This my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, hear him. So there's a period in your life where you must be heard. And there's a period where nobody must hear you because you have nothing to say. You have not finished God's school. If you open your mouth right now, we will we'll see inconsistencies. We'll see your, if we open your closet right now, we will see a lot of inconsistencies, a lot of imbalances. You are not ready to be heard. You have not been carved out yet as a stone to be fit in the church. Keep quiet and keep on serving. Keep on following God. Because John the Baptist, Baptist was in the wilderness until the day of his manifestation to Israel. There was a day that he was manifested to Israel, a particular day, a season. Luke 180. He said he was in the desert till the day that he went to show himself to Israel. So if you show up before that day, you, the kingdom will run at a loss because of you. There are many people, because of them, the kingdom of God has suffered loss. The kingdom suffers violence, not losses. But the kingdom has suffered losses because of people who run ahead of God to present themselves to their generation. These valleys, these cravings of the soul, we can lead to unmet needs as follows. I taught this one when I was teaching, uh, talking about he restored my soul. He restored my soul. Okay, the, 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 the seven longings of the soul. The first one is attention. Second one is affection, satisfaction, security, significance, bonding. Bonding, joy. So I think attention, affirmation, affection, satisfaction, security, bonding, significance, joy. These are the longings of the soul. And let me tell you, these longings of the soul, no human being can meet them to the fullest. It doesn't matter whether you had very caring parents, you were brought up in a very perfect environment, these longings you will never get them from any human being, 100%. You see, for instance, attention, it doesn't matter how you grew up, you will not have 100% attention. Yes. So therefore, everybody has a deficit when it comes to being heard out. Everybody has a deficit. 
Because your parents, no matter how godly and good and caring they, they were, they will never be able to give you 100% attention. Even if you are an only child, never. Your siblings cannot give that one to you. Your spouse cannot give that one to you. So therefore, everybody has a defect in these in this, um, areas. It's only filled by the Holy Spirit, the Word of God. So if you are attesting deficiency, don't blame your parents. You can blame them to a certain point, but you can't put the whole blame on them. You can blame your siblings, your spouse, but you can't put the whole blame on them because they are not perfect. They are not God. But only your relationship with God can take care of this. And if you, are, if you allow the Holy Spirit to work on you, you will get to a point where you will not be attention deficient. Because you have the attention of God. His ears are open to the crowd of the righteous 24-7. He said, come boldly, the throne of grace. Because the room, the throne room is always open. I, I'm always available for you. Now, if you cultivate the habit of going to God frequently, he heals you of your attention deficiency. Otherwise, you can be doing ministry and still want and still have a defect in this attention to the standard. Sometimes you can bind people to yourself with rules and man-made principles because of attention deficiency. You see, when you are teaching loyalty, be very careful. Because loyalty can also be a manifestation of somebody who has an attention deficiency. It depends on how, what you are teaching. The, all those things that will bind you to a person, okay, and will make you like you cannot have free will or you cannot exercise your freedom of association. It's bondage. It's not loyalty. It's bondage. Every relationship, for it to be healthy, there are three principles that should not be compromised. Free will. Purity. Individuality. You must have a f the freedom to be who you are in the relationship. If you have to submit your personality because of the other person, that relationship is abusive. If you cannot express your free will, if even you can't disagree, you can't agree to disagree, and disagreement and divergent views is seen as a uh, rebellion, that relationship is abusive. Affirmation. We all need affirmation in our lives. Right from the time you are young, children soaking affirmation like, like sponge, when you put a uh, sponge in, in water, <laughs> that kind of sponge, that foam sponge, the way it soaks water. Children also soak affirmation. Now, a child will always come to the parent Daddy, look at this. Look at that. Look at that. Now, what is he doing? He wants you to say, oh, it's nice. Oh, you have done well. And when you say that it's nice, the child is affirmed. Children need that a lot. If you're a parent, you must understand that your children will come to you for affirmation. And you must give it to them as much as you can. Always tell them it's nice. They will draw mommy and daddy. And the way they would draw it, you, be, you, 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 you can be angry. <laughs> I say, mommy, look, I've drawn you and daddy. <laughs> he said, oh, it's nice. It's nice. You are doing well. That's how children are affirmed. Now, if a child doesn't go with affirmation, the child will constantly seek to impress people. It's a natural psychological thing. This one is not spiritual yet. Are you getting me? It's a natural thing, but when it becomes a defect in the soul, it means that, that no amount of affirmation will satisfy you. And you will always want to seek affirmation and endorsement and all that. Now, if, when you bring it to ministry, it's worse. It's worse. You see, there are some people, for instance, who maybe came from a very poor background. God has started blessing them. And they vowed that... I will let people see the blessing of God. So, they are always telling the world, look at me. 
Look at what I've done. Look at my car. Look at my house. Look at this. Look at my bank account. Look at my attire. Look at my shoe, my belt. All those things, they are defects in the soul. We see them as ministry, and we, we, we sometimes, young, young ministers sometimes want to be like some ministers. They say, oh, they are bringing glory to God. No. If you tell me, look at the souls, look at the healings, look at the, the, disip the, the disciples, that one I can say we are displaying what God has done in your life. But look at your car. Look at my belt. It's unnecessary. When you stand in the pulpit and you are drawing attention to the belts you wear and how expensive your watch is and how expensive your shoe is and you bought this shoe in South Africa at this cost and uh, you, you bought this car and your car is, is the latest in town. Nobody has your car and the house you live in is uh, 200 uh, rooms and, and this and that. <laughs> All those things, they are manifestations of lack of affirmation. And so they want the world to affirm them. Now, it is, it is purely psychological, you know, like a defect from you know, what the person didn't get. And sometimes, sometimes, even to the extent that, you see, for instance, there are, if you, you, you want people to know, <laughs> okay, let me just go on. Affection. Affection, too, can also be a defect. You know, like we all need affection, okay? The the feeling, the feeling that you 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 are wanted, you are loved, that you are proper, you are you are you are you are acceptable, okay? In my in my world, that you are loved, you are special. That that thing is is everybody wants it. It's not only women who want it to. Everybody wants it, but naturally, everybody wants to belong. Now, if you come to this church, for instance, and nobody talks to you, nobody minds you, you know, you are just left on your own, you say, well, I couldn't fit in. You know, nobody can talk to me. It's natural. I get to me. It's natural. It's, everybody wants it. And it can be a defect in the soul, such that if you don't allow the Holy Spirit to work on it, it can be a big deal. That can stop the work of God. It can stop the work of God. All these things can come in the way of the execution of your, your, your divine assignment if the Holy Spirit does not help you to work on it. So affection is good, but do not say that because you were denied affection, okay, it has affected the work of God. Affected what God says do, because you didn't get the affection that you wanted. It has affected the work of God. It can affect the work of God in many ways. In many ways, you know, uh, there are some people who, um, because of that kind of deficiency or defect, you see, they will, they will become very possessive. Very possessive. You see, in a relationship, normal, I'm talking about male, female, any relationship, when you find yourself becoming possessive, it means that there's an unmet need that you have to pray to God, you know, for God to heal you of. You're becoming possessive. It's like uh, domineering and possessive. I hope you understand all those words. Okay. Now, satisfaction. Satisfaction is also uh, a craving of the soul. We all want satisfaction. It's a feeling of being at peace. A feeling of having arrived. A feeling of having attained, having achieved satisfaction. That's satisfaction. Now, nobody... Nothing in this life can truly satisfy you. If you are allowed to run on your own fuel, for instance, uh, your own natural fuel, you will never be satisfied. No amount of money can satisfy you. Believe you me. You may think, oh, if I can get 100 billion thousand dollars, <laughs> I'll be satisfied. It's not true. <laughs> no. There's a void in our so, only God. It is called contentment. So, when we say poverty, poverty, the spirit of poverty is actually the spirit of discontentment. The love of money, just don't add the need. The love of more is the root of all evil. Just don't add the need yet. Okay? The love, the love of money, but just 
Let's talk about the more. The life of more is the root of all evil. Satisfaction. You see, nothing. Somebody can say, if only I can study to the highest degree, my soul will be at peace. You can climb that ladder and realize that without Christ, your soul, there's leanness. If only I can get money, you can climb that ladder and get to the apogee, the apex, the, the, the zenith, and realize that without Christ, <laughs> you are nothing. If you say, oh, if only I can pursue my career, I'll be satisfied. It's not true. Satisfaction comes from the spirit. We need to come to a place where we have been satisfied. He said, satisfy us early with your mercy. We need to come to a place where he has satisfied us. We are content. You see, that, that is the true meaning of prosperity. It's not maybe having abundance, but you see, contentment. The soul is at rest, at peace. The soul is not making noise, not making noise. He said, those who desire to be rich, not that those who work hard to be rich, oh. those who desire to be rich quick, and they will use any means to be rich, they lack satisfaction in their soul. And they will go and go and go, and they will fall into many foolish and hateful lusts, withdraw many into perdition. Put First Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 to 10. You see what he said, but those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts withdraw men in destruction and perdition. So those who desire to be rich. Why did he say that? Even those who have the love for more without limits, that they desire, they are in a hurry. They want to make it at all, at all costs through fair or foul means. No, you end up breaking yourself. But if you work with God, allow him to satisfy you, okay, then you, you grow. You see, he said, um, I, I desire that you prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. So the kind of prosperity God gives, it that does not take you away from God. If you become too busy because you are getting money, then you are too busy. You become too busy because of your career, too busy for God. You don't even have time for God. Then you are too busy. You become so busy because of work that you can't even have time for, to eat, let alone time to come to church. Then you are too busy. It means that you are working like an elephant, but you will eat like an ant because nothing can satisfy your soul. There's leanness in a man's soul which only God can fill. Only God can fill. You can see somebody and you tell the person that the whole world's good. No. What the person has is contentment and joy. And that brings health. All these running helter skelter at the expense of your health is not prosperity. You run helter skelter, then you chase money and use money, you chase wealth and use wealth to acquire health. It's vanity upon vanity. Only God can save us from that. Security, a sense of being secure. You see, for instance, if let's say um, you are afraid, you see, security, let's say, let's say as a child, you were left alone in the dark room, and that, that opened you up for, let's say, some kind of phobia, let's say claustrophobia. So you fear being left alone in, 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 in abandoned places. Now, psychologically, that thing can affect the child growing up to the extent that you become insecure. That's, that's one aspect of it. You can become insecure. You can become paranoid. You see, you can never sustain a relationship beyond a certain point because you start thinking evil. You will start thinking that this person is, is planning to do me evil. You become paranoid that somebody is chasing you to do you evil. You will take that into everything you do, including ministry. So when you are leading the ministry, for instance, then you begin to set spies. Yeah, because you're not secure. You begin to set spies. Monitor this person and tell me what, whatever he says. What did he tell you? So you and this person, what, what are you talking about me? I want to know. If, if you are, as, as a leader, if I'm doing that, it means I'm insecure. Like, maybe I want to know uh, what uh, Pastor Collins is, is saying about me. 
So when he preached, and I, I asked my wife, so when I was going to preach, did he say anything? What did he say? I've never even done that. To ask her, okay, so what did he say? Is, is there anything he said that it she me? That is security. You are always afraid that somebody is out to do you harm. You can't have friends, genuine friends. You are always afraid of relationships. It, it's, it, it, it's serious. So I'm telling you that if it, if it comes to ministry, a relationship with other believers, it can mar a lot of things. Because, for instance, when you are insecure and you are doing ministry, for instance, you can never tolerate other gifts to grow under you. You cannot. You can't, you can't see other, you can't oversee gifts growing under you. You always have to bring somebody down because the person is trying to outshine you. It's real. You see, these things, I see them all the time. You know, you can, you know, you can, you can say that, oh, it's a coincidence or something, but you will see leaders trying to bring down people who are gifted. Why? Because people who are gifted are also proud. Sometimes people come, I see them, I see that there's a lot of work to be done on them. But I see that they are so full of themselves, they think they have A, B, C. But I just watch them and I commit them to God. After one or two, three encounters, they start coming down. Oh, yes. Even in this ministry. You see? Because the thing is that if I, if I was insecure, there's no way I would allow people to uh, express their gifts. I will be the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the apostle. Nobody will prophesy. I will do it myself. <laughs> oh, yes. And I, and I will not let you teach. I will not let you come and express yourself. Why? Because I will feel threatened. Threatened. That's what insecurity does to you in the work of God. And sometimes you will see people with little, maybe a, a department you are leading, maybe a group you are leading, and you see insecurity. You are afraid that somebody will assign you. So the, this one knows how to do this. Let the person do that. No, 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 I won't let you do. I will do it myself. Meanwhile, you are not good at that, at that particular thing. <laughs> there are many things that will threaten you if these things are not done. What about significance? The feeling of importance. The feeling that you are needed. The feeling that you are needed. Significance. Everybody wants to feel needed. Is that not so? Am I lying? Everybody wants to feel needed. He wants to feel that you matter in somebody's life. Oh, yes. And that one is a natural longing of the soul, but if care is not taken, it becomes a defect. You will try to push yourself, force yourself to be needed in people's lives. And <laughs> that can be a snare. Yeah, that can be a snare. You can force yourself to be needed in people's lives. You can, you can, you can actually um, crave that. Crave that. There are people who will maybe you will meet them one time and maybe they will lay hands on you and they expect that you mention their name. There are people who came to pass through your life and they expect that you attribute everything that God is doing in your life to them. You see, when they don't mention your name, how do you feel? When your name should have been mentioned and your name was not mentioned, you will feel that you have been taken for granted. The person doesn't respect your contribution to that thing. Let's say we are saying, okay, so um, those who gave us this puppy, there are, are five people, no, no, there are six. And you mention one, two, three, four, five, then this person's name is not mentioned. It means that you didn't respect the person's contribution. Now, naturally, the person must feel bad. Because naturally, we all want to be significant. We want to matter. But when it becomes a defect, you realize that it's going to affect your relationship with the person. 
You are never going to forgive the person because the person didn't mention your name. Sometimes your title. When we hold on too much, we hold on so tightly to these things. Titles, names. You should have said, uh, Reverend, you said pastor. You should have said apostle. You said brother. How dare you? <laughs> when God was calling me, where were you? One day, one of God called me, and he was so angry with another man of God. He started releasing curses. I said, wait, take your time. He said, he was preaching, and I entered the room. He did not acknowledge me. He waited till he had finished preaching. And I said, what's wrong with that? I said, I asked him, so what's wrong with that? The person is preaching. He's, maybe he's making a point. Do you know how important it is to deliver the word of God? I want the person to stop and say, oh, yeah, we have everyone so and so here. Let's get up. Listen, I'm not ignorant of ministerial ethics. I will do that for somebody. But if it's not done for you, why should you be angry? Because you have a defect of significance. If, if it's not done for you, should, would you be angry? Why did you to stop preaching to acknowledge me? Even to the standard, to the standard, it got to a point. There were people that they, they had to stop praise and worship to announce that they are coming. I'm telling you the truth. It's not something I heard. Okay, Papa is, Papa is here, so uh, let's welcome Papa. Papa, you're welcome. Listen, when we are praising, worshiping God, and Papa is coming, and we have to stop the worship and welcome Papa, it means that they know Papa will be angry. If we don't stop everything and let our attention go on him. You see, you will see this and say, oh, yeah, that's ministry. Many young ministers, they like those things. They copy wrongly. Well, Papa, Papa is coming, so everything should be stand still. I'm not saying that the, 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 the extreme is also good. Where you don't acknowledge Papa or you don't recognize him and you take him for granted. That one too is not good. I get him. But I'm talking about when Papa feels uh, hurt because they did not, you know, acknowledge him. Why do you want, why do you want to come late in the first place? So that you disrupt the entire service. When the person is busy preaching, then you are coming with your interact. And we have to be moving chairs and, 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 and being distracted before you sit down. They will say, let's work on Papa. Let's, I'm not saying it's wrong, go. If you see that I'm doing that for somebody, it means it's ministerial ethics. But if it's done, if I'm doing that for somebody, like I'm working on somebody, let's work on, that, that's good. But if I go somewhere and they don't do that to me and I feel hurt, it means that there's a problem. I'm telling you the truth. There's a problem. There's a problem. I know sometimes, eh, sometimes you, can, you, you can get to a point where what God is doing in your, in your life will get into your head will get into your head. And sometimes, if, let's say, you don't take care, you will see all these things coming up, you know, because nobody likes to be taken for granted. Yes. But you too, listen, why do you have to take a person for granted? Why do you not mention the person's name? Why should I mention his name? You see, you see the point now? Oh, Yes. That, 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 that's the point. You, you two, you had fault. You provoked the person to become hurt. The person should have been hurt, but, but he's a human. Maybe he's a, he, this, this thing is a, it's an issue. Like, let's say, um, the example I gave, when I said um, there are some places that uh, a friend of mine went to a church and they had to coach him how to give testimony. Oh, you don't remember? When I was talking about witchcraft, I said that example. They had to coach him that the testimony must by all means come and conclude on Papa. <laughs> yes. And so they have to tell lies. And I called Papa. And Papa prayed for me and I was healed. <laughs> oh, yes. 
You see, uh, this thing, it can, I'm telling you the effect of this defect. And you know, the testimony should not be given till the papa is there. So that you can hear. And it uh, must always be bent to papa. And the papa will feel good. So if you don't mention papa's name, that papa was the one who caused that miracle. You are in trouble. After service, you are going to be rebuked. You see, because you are trying to take the shine away from the man of God. But he must be at the center of attraction. All eyes should be on him. He's our savior. That's the, I, 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 that's the mindset. And sometimes, you know, People can also say things that you, you feel hurt because they also took you for granted. And all those things, it, it, that would show you your level of maturity. How you handle those things and those people. Bonding. The soul yearns for bonding. The part of our being that bonds is the soul. That's why we have soul tie. For every friendship, relationship to work, there must be a soul tie, a positive soul tie, where the souls are knit together. In Acts of the Apostles, he said, and the soul of all the believers were one, knit together, and they held all things in common. That was a positive soul tie. Now, when there's a defect for bonding, for instance, it also affects you in how God can work through you. Can work through you. You see, there are some people, for instance, when they enter into friendship with you, the way they are, it's like they, they want to absorb you into their friendship. They want to absorb you. That, that's how they are. It, 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 you see, it, it, because of it stems from that, that thing, that defect. When I went to the university, I had a roommate who was very, a very nice person. I mean, very nice person. We became friends. So one day, you know, like when he's working with you, he wants to hold your hand. He wants to put his hands around you. And I didn't like those things. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we are all guys, I mean, for God's sake. <laughs> and he became so hurt. Why, why are you denying my friendship? And I said, no, I'm not denying your friendship. We can walk without holding hands. We can walk without putting our hands. We are not children that I say, this is my best friend. Then no, you are my roommate. And sometimes um, he, will, he, will, he will make me, try to make me feel guilty. You know, and I, one day I told him, I said, look, what you are saying, I don't agree. I will never hold hands with you again. I will never let you put, I will not, I will not do that. If you, don't, if you don't like it, then let's stop being friends. This matter. <laughs> um, we have to bring in elders, in quotes. <laughs> you see, so I realized that, I realized that he had a bonding defect. You see, because when I, when I studied, when I listened to his background, where it's coming from, I knew that he had a bonding defect. That's why. You know, so he couldn't let go. I mean, even, even when you are leaving the room, going, I mean, he feels that you must always be around him. You must always, and that is, that is a problem. That's a problem. So, bonding gone wrong, bonding gone wrong, can be a disadvantage to you as a believer. That longing for bonding. Everybody has it. But when it goes wrong, it becomes a defect. Then you will see that you become like roots. Roots. That has tentacles. You know, like you, you begin to use your... You know, those, those kind of roots that can uh, climb a wall. When they, or you become like a web. Web. If somebody falls into your, your, your web, the person can never go. If the person wants to go, you want to let the person go. That is a deficiency. You see, we must, we, must be, we must be said that 
we will know when to embrace and when to refrain from embracing. The Bible says there's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time you must let people go. Leave them, let them go. There's a time you must hold on to people. A time you cannot, you cannot use human methods to keep people to be in your life if they don't want to be in your life. A time can let them go. Otherwise, there's, there's a defect. I get TV. So sometimes the, the person is not even helping you, but you are afraid to let the person go because you, the bonding, you have bonded with the person so much. The person is hurting you, but you are still keeping the person. The, the tyranny of the familiar. That's what it's called. The tyranny of the familiar. And you say the angel you don't know, the devil you know, is better than the angel you don't know. That's the phrase that we quote to justify that kind of thing. But it's, it's wrong. We must know where our relationships end. You see, uh, Abraham, when God called him to go and sacrifice Isaac, the Bible says on the third day, Abraham got to a place and he lifted up Isaac and he saw the place of Pharaoh and he told the young men, stay here with the donkeys. The lad and I will go younger and worship. Now, it does not mean that Abraham discarded a young man after they had helped him carry the, the if I, it was Isaac, Isaac who carried the thing, but after they had accompanied him to that place, they said, now you stay here. No. The young men were not supposed to be part of his future. And he knew it. Where he was going, it was supposed to be for himself and Isaac. Sometimes, when it's time for people to leave you, as in a relationship, whatever it is, people to leave you, you can hold on, and you see you are holding on to a branch that has been plucked from the tree. By the time you realize, it's like somebody, it's like a child who was holding on to the mother. The mother was killed. It was a war, a war you know, I think it was Liberia or so. A very, very moving uh, 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 video. The, the, the child was holding the mother like this and crying. But the mother was dead. There are many people who are doing that. You are holding somebody and you are crying, but that thing is dead. That relationship is dead. Let it go. Don't cry over spilt milk. God told Samuel, for how long are you going to weep over Saul? How long? Learn how to learn to know things that are supposed to be a part of your future. There are certain things you don't even cry about them. <laughs> you see, if somebody is in your life and the person wants to walk out of your life and you, you in your own understanding you see that maybe it's time for the person to walk out but the person maybe wants to walk out let the person go sometimes you may what you may think that oh if i if if, if the person goes out and the, no let the person go don't keep people beyond their willingness to stay with you Especially ladies. Don't be like Leah. Jacob will never love you. I'm telling you the truth. It's a painful truth. It is very painful when your husband doesn't love you. When somebody marries you, he doesn't love you. <laughs> Go and ask Leah. <laughs> she did everything. Everything. Including giving birth to four children for Jacob. The man still didn't love her. His love was for Rahel. Don't keep people beyond their willingness to stay, be in your life. And don't force yourself into people's lives beyond that which they permit you. I get TV. Do not force yourself into people's life beyond that which they permit you. Why should I force myself to, 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 to into your life? When this is the gate, you have closed the gate. I come here, you are clear. I will stand here and talk, talk with you. I will not fall, uh, open the gate and be coming. Yes, as a shepherd. As a shepherd, I don't force myself into people's affairs. No. Because I don't have that time. I'm telling the truth. To be forced myself into your affairs, your affairs, your affairs. I want to know what, what's happening in your life. In your life. No, you must tell me what you have in your life. If, if Alfred. You are in a relationship and you're hiding from me. How would I know? Unless maybe there's a dream or vision. 
How would I know? Let's say. Oh, no, no. I'm just. It's, it's an example. Example. No, no, no. Oh, no, no. It's an example. What I'm saying is. Uh, what I'm saying is. How would I know? I get to me. It is you. You must come to me and tell me. Whatever you want me to do for you, come and tell me. Don't assume that I must have that uh, 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 all-knowing ability to know what you're going through. How can I know? <laughs> yes. So I don't bother. So I don't worry myself with those things. So, because I have a lot of things to do. I tell people, look, how far you want me to come into your life, I'll come. Simple. We are all cool. <laughs> I don't... I don't, lose, <laughs> I don't lose a sleep over that. The only time I become worried is when, let's say, something crops up. And I'm like, ah, if only this person had told me I could have helped. That's the only time I become worried. Apart from that, not knowing what is going on in your life doesn't concern me. It's not a worry to me. Because I'm, I'm not <laughs> trying to hold on to you as one person. We are a lot of people who are working. So, for instance, if I'm praying and the Lord prompts me, this person, that, 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 I'll call you. I'll come to you. I'll help you. Apart from that, if you have a need, whether it's a spiritual need, whether it's whatever need, and you think I can be of help, you come to me. Simple. When you come there, I will open my heart and I'll help you. you I, I will not call you and say, come, sit down, let me counsel you. So now, your relationship, can I do that for everybody? But you must come and say, I need advice. What advice? My relationship. What is it? This, that. And I will give you godly counsel. Joy. When you, joy is something that we all long for. That deep satisfaction of contentment and peace within. When, when, when it goes, when there is a defect, you will try to replace that joy with mundane things but they will never make you joyful. You can make yourself happy for a while, but it will not last. All these effects, God wants to work on them. And he does that through the agency of the word of God. Okay, crooked part, made straight. Talks about moral integrity. Areas like sexual morality, covetousness, integrity, faithfulness, <coughs> taming of the tongue. <coughs> this is where God will tame your tongue and teach you how to speak. A word spoken in due season. You know, appropriate word spoken in due season. What not to say. What to say. They are all part of character formation. You know, because the tongue is the most unruly member of the body. And if you don't have to control your tongue, there are many things that will go wrong. Rough places may smooth. It covers the area of relationships how you can grow with others, embracing the body mentality. You see, all these things are part of God shaping our character. So you will get to a point where that you will see that, that when we say somebody is humble, it, 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 it means that the person is able to receive, even from those below him. That's humility. Now, if you, if you receive from those above you, it's not humility. It's wisdom. If you submit to your pastor, it's not humility. It's wisdom. I get it. If you obey his instructions, it's wisdom. But if you humble yourself to people who are on the same level with you or those below you, that's humility. That's why he said, unless you are converted to become like children, you cannot enter the kingdom. Kingdom matters. You have to become like a child. Because sometimes God can bring you an instruction through a child. Through somebody who is below you. Through somebody who is less spiritual than you. And that will be a test on your maturity. Whether you are mature. Whether you are able to humble yourself and take that way that God is bringing. Or you will reject I'm not saying that anybody can just come and say this and you are fooling, you know. No. No, no. That's, 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 that's also not maturity. That because you are humble, so this person will come and say, 
the Lord says, fast for seven days, then you do. This one can say, the Lord says, uh, go to this place, then you do. No, no, it's not like that. At least we two, you, you must hear God sometimes. It's not that you can't hear God. <laughs> okay. Then wisdom for our relationships and relationship with our environment. God will teach us all those things. All, so these four areas are four areas of character formation. Okay. Four tools God uses to work on our character. And four ways each of these tools works. You see, four, four tools. The first tool is the word of God. And so I'm just giving them to you. I'll take time later on. The word of God is a major tool. And the word of God has four different dimensions that God uses to shape the man of God, woman of God. Doctrine, reproof, correction, and instructions in righteousness. These are the four major ways that God uses the word to apply it to our souls for us to uh, 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 have the image enhanced in us. Second tool God uses is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is also uh, one of the people, uh, uh, agents, God uses in shaping us and in molding our character. Holy Spirit. <coughs> and there are four ways the Holy Spirit, four ways he carries out this assignment. You can write them down. I'm just giving them to you. I'll come back to them later on. Number one, mortification. He mortifies our uh, members. Mortification. Number two, pruning. Pruning. Number three, infilling. He fills you. Infilling. And number four, intercession. The Holy Spirit intercedes through you. Jesus intercedes for you. But the Holy Spirit intercedes through you, for you. Okay. Then the third tool God is going to use to shape us is Tutors and governors. Tutors and governors are human beings that God entrusts the flock into their hands. He says, take heed to yourself and the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Acts chapter um, 20, verse 28, Paul was saying that they were overseers. God gives people oversight. Oversight. And the tutors and governors, this, these are the four ways they help you in terms of character building. If these four ways are not there, they are not tutors and governors. Number one, they give you food in due season. They feed you with the word of God. So people that God has given oversight over you, they will feed you with the word of God. Number two, they watch over you. Spiritually, they pray for you. You may not know that they pray for you. You may also know, you know, once in a while you will know that they pray for you. But if the person is praying for you, you see, like Paul will pray for the people that he ministers to. He will say, I, anytime I go on my knees, I pray for you, that God will fill you with the spirit of wisdom, that God will fill you with the knowledge of his will, that, uh, that the, the Christ may be formed in you. He was always praying for them. You cannot say that God has given you oversight over somebody and that the Lord does not burden you with prayer concerning the people. Yes. So, so a pastor's job is not just to preach. The major part of the job of a pastor is, is not done in the church. If you are an overseer, if you are, let's say you are overseeing people, let me even say that you are even... You are even shepherding like five people in a church department. If you are really doing the work well, your major work is in a secret place. You see, do you know, for instance, the labors you go through just to prepare food to come and serve your people? The labors, sometimes the sleepless nights, the tiredness that you have to overcome. Like yesterday, the way... <laughs> The way I, I went, that how I was so tired, I still had to wake up at 11.50, as I do always, uh, to show that I can pray. And I still, I, I always pray for, I pray for you. Pray for you. The Lord, open the eyes of the understanding. Open their hearts. 
Let them understand the word. Let the word enter their hearts. Let them bear fruit according to your word. I pray prayers. I don't just, it's not just prayers like, oh God, give them breakthroughs. That, those are also prayers I pray. Especially when I see needs and all that. People who are going through issues, I pray. I, I don't just teach you. I also pray for you with, with compassion. You know, the, the trouble it takes to get food in due season for God's people, because of that, there are many people who don't major on teaching systematically. There are many churches you go that they will not major on teaching you systematically. Why? Because it's hard work. It's the hardest work. I can give you motivation. I can just come and give you empty promises and tell you, I'll be well with you. Amen. And this and that and that. I can read books and come and teach them to you. I can listen to teachings and paraphrase and come and teach them to you. To sit down and pray and to know the mind of the Spirit concerning this day and concerning this people, how he can minister to everybody. It takes a lot of hard work. That's why there are some places where they will substitute the preaching of the word for many things, including the entertainment. And so you see a chunk of the service is dedicated to things like prophecy, uh, it can be prayer, never consciously dividing the word. Because that is harder. Harder than just coming here and saying, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, take it. I, I can do that. I can decide to turn this Sunday service into Holy Ghost service. Every Sunday, Holy Ghost, take it. And every Sunday, people will take it. <laughs> <laughs> People will take it every Sunday. Instead of teaching you the word systematically for you to know to grow as a believer. Then, being good example. That's also one of the, one of the work of the tutors and governors. Because you have to model what you are teaching the person. If I'm teaching you something and you can't see it in me, it means that I'm not being effective. Because a, a, a picture... Uh, speaks more than a thousand words. The last one, counseling. Counseling to bracket, rebuke, exhortation, correction, advice. Tutors and government, that's how they also shape character. So there can be exhortation, there can be counseling, rebuke, correction, advice. Then the last two that God uses, circumstances. And uh, under that one, there are four major things that can that God can use under circumstances to mold your character. The first one is shaking. He can shake you, shake you by circumstances. Second one is emptying, pouring out. God can empty you from vessel to vessel. <laughs> That's a way of shaping your character. I'll talk about all these things, you know. <laughs> Third one is trials. Things that you go through, per persecution, trials. The fourth one is chastening of the Lord. Let's go on our feet and let's pray. So these are the four major areas of character that God works on. Mountains that might be brought low and valleys that will be exalted. Crooked places that will be made straight. Rough edges that will be made smooth. Then there are four instruments God uses. The word of God, the Holy Spirit, Tutors and governance, governors and circumstances. And uh, I want us to pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise. Thank you, Lord. We are praying to surrender to Him. We are admitting to him that, Lord, we are the clay. You are the porter. I give you the permission. I surrender my life to you. Mold me. Lord, shape me into the form you want. Let, Lord, help me. Let your mercy never depart from me. Mold me. Shape me. Break me, if you will, oh God. Mold me anew. Shape me anew. I yield to you. You are the porter. 
I am just the clay. Mold me, Lord. Change me from within. I surrender to you. Work on me. Work on me, Lord. Work on me. Till all that is left in me, Lord, is you. Do not stop the work, Lord, till I resemble you. So I become like you in my disposition, in my thinking, oh, in my choices, in my actions, in my behaviors. Lord, till I become like you, till I see like you see, till I see things from a perspective, till your perspective informs my choices, Lord. Work on me, O God. Work on my heart. Work on my heart, Lord. Work on areas of my life. Work on my mountains and my hills. Work on my valleys, O God. Work on my crooked paths, O God. And work, Lord, on my rough places. Oh, Father, I surrender to you. Yes, Lord. Just work on me, Lord. Mold me, build me, Lord. Oh, use me, fill me. Do your work in my life. Libra hata bahasa, mande brede ko sele baha. Onda bahala kado shante peles, mende brede ko nem bahali yada. Ingoni basanda le da katala, le ko bro ondo ste bahali yada. Brende de salama kamba anda. Oh, yes. we are praying this prayer also. Give me the grace to yield, the grace of yieldedness, the ability to yield to you. The ability to yield, Lord, not to struggle with you, but to yield to you, yield to you, to open up to your influence, open up to your work, Holy Spirit. Oh, yes, Libra Hadabaha, Shendebah, Mekepele Mekombalia da Basonde, Ego Mada, Likadia, Meleno Salemahari, Rembe Likatala, Londa Parada Co Zendade, Mekombre de no Sin de Pahara. Mele Makobaha. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Oh, the grace to heal, Lord. Take away any stony heart, oh God. Take away any stubbornness, oh heart. Any stubbornness, any, any malice, any superfluity of naughtiness. And it, it help me to receive you. Receive your direction with meekness. Receive the implanted word with meekness. Which is able to save my soul. Oh, take away stubbornness, oh God. Take away rebellion from my heart. Rebellion, oh God. Help me, Lord. Have mercy on me, Lord. Have mercy on me. And take away re a rebellious attitude. And help me. Give me grace to yield. Grace to yield. Grace to yield. Grace to humble myself. Grace to humble myself, oh God. Ship me, oh God. We are praying this last prayer for Ghana. Let the light of God expose all the hidden works of evil. Let satanic agents who are planning to destabilize Ghana's democracy fall and be broken beyond recognition. Let's pray. In the name of Jesus. Ghana will not die. Ghana will live. In the name of Jesus. God's plan for Ghana will stand. In the name of Jesus. Let the light of God expose all the hidden works of evil every move satanic move any meeting gathering regrouping for demonic agenda to destabilize Ghana's democracy or to destabilize this year's election or to destabilize the peace we are having in the name of Jesus let them be exposed and arrested let demonic agents be exposed and arrested in the name of Jesus, let them be broken beyond recognition. Let them be scattered. Let their meeting be scattered. Let their gatherings end in confusion. Let their mind rebel against their bodies. We disorganize their thinking and we break their systems. In the name of Jesus, we hijack their system. We destroy them in the name of Jesus. Let the hand of God come down strong on all demonic agents. Who are planning to plant Ghana into bloodshed or into chaos in the name of Jesus? Ghana is God's country, and God said, Ghana is my jewel. 
he said Ghana is my jewel therefore anyone who touches Ghana has touched the apple of God's eye in the name of Jesus have mercy on this nation oh God thank you Lord Jesus my heart one desire is to be holy set apart for you Lord I choose to be Jesus' name. Amen.